Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to ask and answer the musical question, what has a longer shelf life? A Hostess Twinkie, the fabulous, legendary Hostess Twinkie, or a major studio recording of an operatic masterpiece on a major label with international celebrities and artists. In this case, Verdi's Aida. See, Aida, there we go. It doesn't reflect well. Aida, starring, starring, let's see, Anya Harteros, Jonas Kaufmann, Yekaterina Semenchuk, uh, Ludovic Tezier, Irwin Schrott, other people like that, and the Santa Cecilia Orchestra and Chorus under Antonio Papano on Warner Classics. So, which one lasts longer? First, let me tell you something about the Hostess Twinkie. When I was a kid, there was a rumor circulating around that the shelf life of a Twinkie was such that it would survive a nuclear holocaust. The rumor was that a, a you know, back in the 1950s when everyone thought that the U.S. and Russia were going to annihilate each other, and they still may, um, people built bomb shelters, and they had bomb shelters in schools particularly. I mean, they're still there. And we had civil defense drills where they made us crawl under our desk because they thought that would save us from a direct hit by a nuclear bomb. Yeah, right. Sure. And they had radiation safe zones. And one of the things they had in these bomb shelters was was rations, rations that were supposed to last decades and decades and decades. And the story went that they finally decided to forget about it because they realized that crawling under our desk and running into the basement was not going to save us from the nuclear holocaust, um, that they should just clean out these bomb shelters. And they were getting rid of the biscuits and things that had been there since like the 1950s. And sometime it was around the 1970s, they discovered that a worker had left his hostess Twinkie in the bomb shelter. And although all of the other rations had completely dried up and disintegrated and been eaten by rats or whatever, the hostess Twinkie was still as fresh as the day it was made. Yes. So the shelf life of a Twinkie was theoretically indefinite. It's actually not. But I do notice, I mean, and I looked very carefully, that this particular box um, does not have an expiration date anywhere, nor do the individually wrapped Twinkies contained therein. Um, you know, I mean, it just says, has like a whole bunch of numbers, um, but none of them are dates. So I really have no idea when a Twinkie expires, but I assume it's quite a while because we can look at the list of ingredients here and I think we can get a clue, probably. Let's see, what have we got here? We have sugar water, enriched flour, which is, you know, bleached wheat flour, malted barley flour, niacin, ferrous sulfate or reduced iron, thiamine mononitrate, riboflavin and folic acid, high fructose corn syrup, in case you don't have enough sugar, tallow, ugh, uh, dextrose, egg, contains 2% or less, soybean oil, cornstarch, modified cornstarch, hydrogenated tallow, more tallow, ugh, whey, glycerin, salt, sodium acid pyrophosphate, baking soda, enzymes, sorbic acid, and potassium sorbate to retain freshness. Aha! There you go. It's the potassium sorbate. Cottonseed oil, mono and diglycerides, cellulose gum, sodium stearol, steroil, well, steroil, um, lac lactylate, there we go, soy lecithin, xanthan gum, polysorbate 60, monocalcium phosphate, natural and artificial flavor, yellow and red number 40, contains egg, milk, soy wheat, and contains bioengineered food ingredients. Now, I'm all for bioengineering. I think we should bioengineer the heck out of everything. So that's fine. So there's your Twinkie. Put it all together and you've got something that's got one heck of a long life. Well, now, let us compare that to Aida. How do you determine the shelf life of an Aida? Well, this is was a major release, a really important major release. I mean, it's a studio recording with major, major singers. 
um, under one of the great operatic conductors before the public. It's on three discs. It comes in a beautiful book with complete text and libretto in several languages. It is absolutely the way these things ought to be produced. And it went out of print like 15 minutes after it was released. And now I see, just released, this. Aida. What is it? Well, it's this, except what they've done is knocked it down from three CDs to two by making one 80-minute CD, cheapening it up, of course, um, and re-releasing it with no texts and no librettos. I mean, it has a note with a synopsis, of course. But, I mean, it's not even there's not even a website where you can go to get the libretto, although you can find it anywhere, let's face it. Um, and so it is back cheapy, cheapy, cheap, or cheaper than this was. And you have to wonder why, if they could have gotten this thing at full price and on three discs and instead of making it, why didn't they just leave it in print and make it nice and keep it around? Because let me tell you, the Twinkie has been around for something like 70 years. Originally, it was filled with banana filling, but um, they changed it to vanilla cream because I, I think vanilla cream, they could make last forever, whereas bananas had a natural rate of decay, kind of like plutonium. And so, you know, you couldn't keep the banana there. So the Twinkies are still around exactly as they have always been since the vanilla cream went in around 1950-something. There they are. But Aida, a brand new, beautiful recording of Aida, well, this was released in 2015. This was released now. So you do the math basically eight years. That is the shelf life of a major new operatic recording. Now, we've been doing a series of videos on things like um, reference recordings. And one of the things I said about reference recordings is that the way something becomes a reference is that it has to be around long enough for enough people to hear it, for people to have a consensus about it, for some sort of, sort of, general feeling to develop around the quality of the recording and, and whether it works as the one that we want to compare other ones to, and or the one to which we want to compare others. I mean, let me get my grammar straight. So, so though, and most of those reference recordings come from the 50s and 60s and 70s, that period of time. Let's think about Aida for a minute. Why is it that um, Aida has reference recordings. Well, it does because there have been two versions that were issued and that were always available for decades, decades. You hear me? As long as a Twinkie, they're still available. Leontine Price with George Schulte and Carrion with Renata Tabaldi. Those were your basic reference Aida's. And I will be talking about Aida and reference recordings. We'll talk about those again, but uh, bottom line. And they were reference recordings because you could get them forever. Even though Leontine Price made another one, you know, there were mono ones before that. These were the reference recordings for Aida. I mean, bottom line. And so, and so they were around long enough for a consensus to arise. Eight years is not long enough. And even though this is now being reissued, it's being done in a way that gives it absolutely no play whatsoever. At least when this came out, I, I remember reading about it. It was something of a big deal because studio recordings of operas in 2015 were rare. Most of them were either just live or they were DVDs. You know, so this was a big deal. And they said it was a big deal, but if it's really a big deal, you have to let it sit around long enough for people to buy it, right? For it to become an important thing. And, and obviously they haven't because it went out of print and then I saw this, and I, I was scratching my head when I saw this in the soon-to-be-release list. I said, wait a minute, that's already out. I own it. What are they releasing it again? They didn't really make it clear that this was the cheaper um, version of this. Um, and I'm really very disappointed that they did it because this is a beautiful production, you know, with a little bit of press, a little bit of, of push. It's a very, very fine performance, by the way. Um, you know, it could have become a modern reference recording, but someone has to get behind it. Somebody has to make sure that it's available. Somebody has to promote it. Somebody has to, it's not even a question of spending money on it other than keeping product in stock, you know, warehousing it somewhere. But it's more a question of, of allowing time and, and allowing the singers an opportunity to have, 
you know, international reputations that slightly break out of the normal classical music opera ghetto, doing something so that people know that this thing exists, that it's out there, and that it matters. And the way to show that it matters is to just keep it available. Eventually, people are going to say, hey, wait a minute, this thing's been in print forever. It must mean something. There must be something to it that makes it special. That's what happened with those other Aidas. They were just there. After a while, I mean, Leontine Price retired, Renata Tabaldi retired, but these recordings were out there. They were out there and they were important. And people, they were important because people felt that the, the, that the promotion that they received meant that they were significant. And they were excellent performances, that too. Of course, they were wonderful performances. Just as the Twinkie has been around since the 1950s, and even though it's full of, shall we say, questionable ingredients, and um, eating too many of them may, you know, obviate the necessity for you to find an embalmer after you pass away, the fact of the matter is, uh, people buy them and, and they have a name, they have a brand, they have a reputation, and they have a shelf life. And it's a much longer shelf life than that of the typical opera performance um, witnessed it by this Aida. What does that tell us about our classical music culture? I ask you. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.